the second the referee walks over to that screen yeah, and he it. does this, you know it's, it's over. over. <laughs> He's overturning the decision. That's why Sean don't see it. Right, yeah. they're not yeah, sticking yeah. to their guns anymore. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Yahoo Footballing Weekly with me, regular Yahoo columnist, Neil Humphreys. And me, regular <laughs> Yahoo editor, Chad. <laughs> Every day. Every day, full time. And we have a new guest. Not really a new Not guest. New For this, guest season. this season. Yeah. This season. Russ, Russ Winder. Yes, um, it's an honour and a pleasure to be here again. It feels like getting the national call up again. Wow. Because uh, you know, I've been don't, watching don't. the show and, and all that. You've had other guests. Promise. So I, thought, I thought I missed my boat. No, no, no. no, no. Promise something. you don't need to sign extra or do anything. Yeah. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and we must give you a shout out. You're wearing the t-shirt. Back Past is your wonderful podcast. I've been on the podcast. Tell us a little bit about it quickly. Yeah, so it's a podcast that covers the 90s and the noughties. The best time for football, I feel. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Uh, not, not really a Liverpool or crap then. But well. Yeah. I'm trying to West Ham, <laughs> but it was tough, still man. a good decade. Tough, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, it's a fun pot, uh, yeah. podcast. Good couple you? of decades of football. And so we cover everything local, from local football, Malaysian football. That was the best time for local football. Uh, international football, uh, English, of course, and uh, European. Yeah, so everything. We got posts every day. On right. our That's Facebook page and Instagram page, so there's always something that we feature. It's either we have our podcast coming out or we have a feature. Yeah, you have those little nuggets of information. Sometimes I didn't even know yeah. that thing happened in the 90s. I'm like, whoa. I'm yeah. still waiting for the t-shirt though <laughs> that he's wearing. It's a very nice t-shirt, yeah, but nice. I haven't I got have one, one yet. Yeah. Just go to the website and see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll buy it. Don't worry. But thanks to guys like Russ Vinder and your wonderful selves, week on week, audience building, we have our friends from Starhub giving you another oh. fantastic deal. Yeah, we've been talking about this. All October, they're going to do a partnership with a Canadian 2 for 1 pizza. 2, two for, for one. 1. Okay, <laughs> they're going to send lucky football fans, EPL fans, to, to down to England to watch their favourite teams live. In person. Have you heard this? It's a good deal, right? It's a really good right? deal, you know? Yeah. So what you got to do is just go to Canadian 241, order their Premier League pizza bundle, mm. and then you get a stand, you get you'll stand a chance to win tickets to, you know, lucky draw, you might stand a chance to go and uh watch your watch your favorite Premier League games. So for this month, okay, it's almost at end of October, so you don't have much time. Go and order them. The the price money, the price is Liverpool versus Manchester United oh dear. at Anfield. <laughs> what more do you want? What of, more do yeah, you want? On 16th of December. So you got a, a couple of days left. Brilliant. Quick. Buy a Premier League pizza. Buy two for one pizza. Good, good for dinner for four. Yep. <laughs> and then, and, and, and then, you know, for United. Good luck. And yeah. Good luck. Yeah, here's, here's the website yeah. to go down to. You could go and watch Manchester United get beat. <laughs> What do you want? Two probably. for one? <laughs> Two for one. You, you get a pizza and you get mad you're getting beat. Oh, wonderful. Happy days indeed. All right, moving on. I tell you where there are happy days right now. Oh. And it pains me to say it, being West Ham born and bred. The North Londoners, yeah. the white side of North London, Tottenham Hotspur are flying. They're top of the table. Unbeaten. Unbeaten. Before we get into it, Ange Postacoglu has now set a record for the most points for a new manager after nine Premier League games. I think it'll extend that further because they've got a relatively easy game. I think it's Palace yep. coming up on Friday. Friday. That's so tricky, right? Tricky, but still, it's winnable. Point is, top of the table, unbeaten, nine games in, comfortable against Fulham. How far can they go? And still, he wasn't that satisfied with a 2-0 two, two win against Fulham. Which I like. Yeah, he was saying second half, they are sloppy, we are sloppy. And I know, I know we are winning, but we can get better. And that's a great attitude for being a manager, you know, not to get too carried away by, you know, being top of the league after in October. I, I, I still think they will sort of fizzle out in the end. Mm. It's still, you know. That's but, what everyone thinks, right? Yeah. <laughs> until maybe February, uh, then maybe if they are still top, then we can think uh, relate to Leicester in, in 2016, you know, that kind of that kind of amazing feat. But still a long way to go. Yeah. But still, it's a good time. Congratulations, Spurs fans. Long suffering Spurs fans. Yeah. Good luck. Enjoy the ride while it lasts. Hopefully, it can last until 
uh, lit season. Yeah, I mean, what it's given us, Rasvinder, is a proper title race. I mean, Manchester United are not in it, but <laughs> at least we've got one. We've got a proper yeah. title yeah, race this yet. year. Be positive. Not yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, and it's good because, um, well, on the point of choking, I think there's something in the air in North London. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, so far, so good for Spurs. I hope it lasts all the way till May and they win it. Ooh. I don't mind. I don't mind that because they. Uh, I have a bit of a soft spot for Spurs because they. I watched the one of the first English matches I watched live was actually the Spurs, uh, nineteen ninety one FA Cup semi final. The Gaza, yeah, Gaza, Gaza final. yeah, the oh, Gaza one, right, yeah. Right. So that that was one of the first yeah. games I watched. So I've got a bit of a soft spot for Spurs. I hope they do well, but yeah, still a long way to go. I like the attitude the Ange has brought into Tottenham. Because I, I remember in one of the interviews, uh, someone asked, you know, Spurs fans are getting a bit carried away. Should they carry away, get carried away or, you know, temper down their expectations? He, he, said, said, he said, you know, they've been suffering for so long. Exactly let them, that. Just let it be, you know. Exactly that. I couldn't agree more. I mean, you over there, the grumpy one, <laughs> saying, oh, no, but I agree. You know, oh, it's not going to last. It's not going to last. Who cares? Just enjoy it, right? You're top of the table. You're undefeated. You've had the torturous managers of Conte <laughs> and Mourinho. Oh. You're playing the best football Tottenham have seen in North London for years. There's footage of Ange Postacoglu on the touchline, to your point, saying, attack, attack, attack. You know, someone filmed him saying, you're not pressing, you're not pressing. And he was critical of the Fulham game. Because of that, yeah. they were not pressing fast enough in the second half. They are going to drop points. I completely agree. I don't think they have the depth mm. in yeah. the squad. Yeah. Mm. But who knows? It's, to me, it's like Leicester City. Just enjoy the ride and see how far it goes. They're and they playing got no better European football, football than Leicester did. And I love Leicester's achievement. But it's better to watch at Tottenham. And they got no European football exactly. as well. So they, the they got a whole week to prepare for all their matches. So yeah, why not? Go for it, man. And he hasn't changed. Come on, you Spurs. My, yeah, well, steady. Steady, <laughs> steady. But, I mean, Edge Postacoglu, I love him. You know that because he hasn't changed. Yeah. The same relentless pressing philosophy that kicked him on at Brisbane, then Melbourne, then Japan, then Celtic. He hasn't diluted it or compromised in any way. Mm. In fact, like you said, second half, he's moaning that they're not pressing enough. Yeah. Great stuff. I hope it continues. Yeah, I hope it continues. But as always, let us know what you think. Are Tottenham genuine title contenders now. Send your thoughts and views too. Yahoo Southeast Asia on YouTube, Yahoo SG, Yahoo underscore MY on Twitter, Yahoo SEA on TikTok. All right, Merseyside, where we definitely do have <laughs> a title contender in Everton. So, <laughs> no, 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 just kidding around. No. Liverpool, come on, what do you think, Liverpool? Uh, I mean, it's becoming routine now. I mean, what? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not letting that go. What? Winning is now routine, is yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, uh, at Anfield, you can expect, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we all to, like, you know, toy around Everton a bit. Uh, trying to, I'm this trying guy, to rub it in. I'm trying to rub guy, it in. Right, toy was... around Everton a bit, and then, you know, so they, they get a grief over us. Uh, 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 a decision, refereeing decision, and if they will run out winners. This guy last season, Ras Vinder, was crapping his pants almost every week. They can't defend, they can't do this, they still can't defend. But, but I guess Even I mean, at the start of this season, yes. you said. Uh, uh, yes. Now winning is, oh, it's blase. No, but against Everton, I, I would take any kind of easy win over Everton. But it wasn't easy, was it? Really? Ah, it, was, it, was it was a, a bit, scrappy game. Yeah, it was a bit hairy for a while. I mean, I mean, I think we got away with a major decision. Uh, <laughs> Konate we'll to, should have gotten a I yellow heard. card and then be sent off, but... Well, got away with one, and then eventually we got grinded out, grinded out the win. But okay, fine. The, we'll take we'll take the the three points, and then you know, ho hopefully, have, can condemn Everton to a relegation somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> that's his think? ultimate dream, I think. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it'll be un Rele insufferable. Yes. <laughs> but what do you think, Russ Vinder? We'll get to the VAR, but I just feel, and I like Liverpool's attack. I think it's great, but I, they do feel a little too over reliant on Mo Salah to bail them out. You know, my, I love Nunes, but he's got a touch of the Diego Forlan about him. <laughs> he needs too many chances to score. It's true, it's true. And you never have the confidence. He's not quite Antonio at West Ham. Let's not get carried away. But he's certainly not Harry Kane. No. Harry Kane goes through, it's over. It's yeah, a goal. Yeah. Um, so they've got a little bit of inconsistency in attack. They're too reliant upon Salah. There's defensive issues slightly. What do you think, Liverpool? Yeah, Liverpool, I've, of course, I don't watch them play. But, you know... <laughs> 
Nice. I've heard a lot about Liverpool, you know, from fans, from Liverpool fans that they've said, you know, oh, you know, we got away a bit in this game, you know, that could have, that moment there for the opposition team, they could have scored, the game could have changed, but all this could have, would have, in the end, they've still won the games, they've exactly. still got the three points, that's what matters. And I think, I hate to admit it, but of course, I got to say, the closest challenges to City, as he has been proven for a number of seasons now, is Liverpool mm. in terms of the style of play, the players they've got. Um, I'll talk about refereeing decisions. We'll get to that. Yeah, we'll get to that. Okay, but in terms of the squad makeup, I think really good team they've got. And I remember uh, probably last season where Liverpool fans were panicking and they were saying, you know, F- FSG out and wow. you know, oh, they're not making enough signings, they're not refreshing the Terrible. team. Yeah. yeah, but I think you don't know what you got. Yeah. Yeah. It's better FSG than in Glazers. So, oh, absolutely. No. Because they've got the right people in the club. Yeah. You know, in the, the structure is right. They are f- they are sporting people. They are, I wouldn't say they're footballing people, but they're sporting people. Yeah. They know what sports is about, what winning is all about. They've got the right coach, they've got the right uh, you know, technical director, mm. sporting director, whoever else is handling uh transfers and all. They got the right guys in charge, they bought the right players for the team and you know, now look at them. Now, let's talk about the wrong people in charge. VAR. (laughs) Let's get to VAR. I've got two thoughts about the latest VAR farce involving Liverpool. The first problem with VAR is it's just feeding the conspiracy theories again. Have you heard the latest one? The reason Canate wasn't sent off is because VAR are trying to rebalance their mistake that they made for the Liverpool game against Tottenham a few weeks ago. It's absolutely absurd, Mm -hmm. but as long as you've got these inconsistencies, you're going to feed into this conspiracy nonsense. That's the first point. But the second point is the more worrying one. VAR is is forcing referees to second-guess themselves too much. That's the one. The referee in the Liverpool game, I think, was Craig Pawson. Craig Pawson, he had a terrible game. He was... Reluctant to make any decisions. Yeah. He was almost fobbing off Over everything. On yes, yeah. everything he was referring to VAR. So you're reaching a point now where the referee is either A, scared to make a decision, mm. or B, if he does make a decision and he gets the, you know straight away he's overturning it. The second the referee walks over to that screen yeah, and he does this, you know it's, it's over. over. <laughs> He's overturning the decision. That's what Sean Dyche said. Right, yeah. they're not yeah, sticking yeah. to their guns anymore. And what's happening is the best referees in the past, they had a feel for the game. They had a feel. You couldn't examine every tackle in isolation. You had to have a feel. It's a Merseyside derby or it's a North London derby. So it's going to be a certain way of playing. and it's, You've got to feel this player and that player. All that's going out of the window. And the tech is taking charge and it's ruining the game yeah and and you know like you say the the referees having a feel of the game and that's what actually happened to that instance the everton play was so far away from the the, the goal they yep. still, still had a half the pitch to to, to run to yep. run towards the goal konate yes tripped uh pulled him and tripped him a bit and at that time maybe in during the during the the game um the, the the referee could have said, okay, I I will have to give him one final warning. That that could have been his thought of giving him one final warning before giving him another red card. Just let the game flow on. Yes. Not don't don't consider don't I don't agree. send anybody off. Even though Ashley Young has already been sent off. And that's that's what that's the contention. Yeah. An Everton player has been sent off already. And this one you definitely have to be be, you know, fair and then also send off the Liverpool player. But like you say, that part that part is not not out and out a uh, yellow card because it's so far away from being a direct one on one attempt. So so you know, but you know now now if like you say it fits all the conspiracy theories. Yeah. That, oh, this this Everton saying oh they, this is Liverpool. They, are, they are getting the rub of it's, it's nonsense. nonsense. Yeah. What do you think, Rasvinder? Now you are someone for the benefit of our listeners and viewers. You organise a lot of football tournaments. You arrange for referees and things like that. So you deal with officials every day in your job. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the way officiating is going because of VAR? Okay, so I think this two issues are you gotta put it in isolation. First of all, I always feel that during the course of the season, this te- this kind of things even itself out. For the most it, part, it always yeah. even itself out. Yeah. If not this season, maybe next season. This is what I always feel from watching football for so many years now. 
so when Liverpool making the wine and were whining and moaning about <laughs> yes. the thing, the the goal that was disallowed oh. and all that jazz, I always felt okay. Come on, man, get on with it. You know, you yeah. will you'll you eventually get yeah you'll get your something way, in your yeah. favor. Yeah. And also, I think I saw somewhere some stat someone posted that Liverpool has benefited the most from VAR decisions. How far true that is, I am not sure, and how I mean, I'm not sure how verified that is. You know, to say so, it could be a conspiracy as well. Mm. On the other <laughs> hand, I say it's all a plot. It's all a plot. <laughs> yeah. On the other hand, also I say whatever Liverpool's reaction was to that Sp- in that Spurs game after the Spurs game, it probably is a bit of a psychological masterstroke from Liverpool. Mm. I'll I'll say it like that because what that has done is that yes. Place doubts in the referees' yeah. minds. Fergie like. used to do yeah, that. Yeah, Fergie used to do that. Fergie was, was, was the king of that. that. Yeah. yeah, so you, it's a you know a page from Fergie's handbook. Yeah. So they've yes. da- they've applied that. So if they, and now the referees, whenever a decision is gonna go against Liverpool, they think a few times, a million times, uh, and, and they might err on the side of caution. Yes, but Rasvinder, some watching this might say that is also a conspiracy theory. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah, correct. Right. That's true. That's true. It's, it's, it's a conspiracy, also a conspiracy theory, theory about a conspiracy yeah, theory. Correct. All but my, this is the problem. Yeah. This is the problem that VAR is creating. We're talking about all this nonsense, VAR, uh, conspiracy theories, mind games. We're not talking about the games. Yeah. yeah. On VAR itself, I would say in England, I don't think it's been implemented well. That is the problem. That is the biggest problem. I feel the referees are not implementing it well. They are probably don't understand how to use it or what, which is why it's creating such a bad impression or mm. bad reputation in English football. But you look outside of England. Yeah. I, I watch Italian football regularly. No such issue. What's what's clear is clear. What's not is not. There's no not much controversy when it comes to this kind of thing. Of course, there's still. Bits of controversy. Of yes, there will still be. Because there's always but, human error. Yeah, there's always and human always error. Subjective. Correct. It's always subjective. That's right. And also, when you bring up the point about me and my referees and all that, there's also always this kind of issues. Teams will come and complain to me, hey, referee wasn't right, lie, he was biased against me. That kind of issues I, I face as well is in the... In my career. But it's true what you said because even the Women's World Cup, I can't remember any major VAR yeah. yeah. cock World Cup. FIFA even World, World Cup. Cup, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The right. EPL seems to be the only one. But as always, let us know what you think. Speaking of inconsistency, the other London match this week, the big one Arsenal against Chelsea. Chelsea. Are Chelsea back? Are Arsenal faltering? What do you think? No, I don't think they are faltering a bit, uh, Arsenal. I think they're. they're they, I mean, they obviously they went 2-0 down and then they, they somehow dragged themselves back into 2 all and then could have even won the match. Um, but I, I think maybe maybe after a two-week international break, they come back they're a bit rusty, they're not, not clicking at the start of the game and then finally got into gear. By the time they got an error, they got a penalty and then one good goal from Mundrik, from, that's a, quite, quite a wonderful goal. Uh, bit of a fluke though. A bit of a fluke. I think it's a fluke. And I don't a, think it's a wonderful. It, it, it looks, it it never, looks wonderful, but it was a fluke. We'll never know. Okay. So, so I think I think Chelsea are starting to. I think it's more Chelsea are starting to become yeah. uh, gel mm-hmm. under Pochettino. Yeah, I agree. I think I think Mudrik has now become a contributed goals and assists. And you know, the the team generally looks a bit more less less like a hit nut nut job than than than, than before. <laughs> so so I mean it was a tough match and then Arsenal to one point at Stamford Bridge usually people would say yeah. okay fine it's fine but especially in coming from but Arteta down. was also yeah. on, a bit like Angie Postecoglou said no I don't think anybody is happy with one point so I mean but fair play to them they are still uh, just about one or two points behind Spurs still in the mix yeah. still in the mix so they, they could let this go a bit yeah the interesting thing for me I think Mikel Arteta is facing arguably the biggest coaching decision he's had to make at Arsenal Raya, over the goalkeepers. Oh, yes. Because, oh. and I don't like to trash goalkeepers or coaches or whatever, but that poor man, you mentioned uh, the Mudrik goal there. Part of that reason, yes, it was a fluke. He was way out of position. Correct. He, he should not. To, to, yeah, yeah, exactly. He should not have got beaten from that distance. Yeah. He had more than enough time to correct his footing and readjust. He didn't. It was a soft goal to concede. And at that point, Arsenal fans started to sing Aaron Ramsdale's name. Now, he was off, actually, because I think his partner had just had a baby anyway. But he's back now. And Arteta's got a decision to make. Does he stay stubborn 
and stick with Raya, even though Raya does not look presently a shot stopper as consistent as Ramsdale, or does he put his hands up and do a Alex Ferguson famously in the FA Cup final, dropping Jim Layton and bringing in oh, Les Seeley, one of the most boldest coaching decisions I've ever seen, and admit you've made a mistake and change the goalkeepers. Because if he doesn't get it right, it's gonna this cost. will come back to bite him a hundred percent. What do you think? First on Chelsea. I was, let me speak a bit about Chelsea. I think I saw the score 2 0 up. I thought, whoa, I think Chelsea's back. I think Chelsea could be back here, you know. Mm. But they've had a good sequence of results as well. Mm. And I thought, wow, this, uh, if they win this 2 0, then I think they're officially back. But Arsenal coming back from 2 0 down to draw 2 2 is not bad because considering the circumstances. They're they half back. Yeah, they're, they're 2 0 up. And I think that result, regardless of the. You know, uh, two points drop in Chelsea's case. I think it still would give them a lot of confidence yeah, yeah, I now. Agree. now I, agree I think they'll. I think they'll push on. I think they'll. They are gelling, and uh, and I think a lot of people forget that actually they have assembled a very good squad. It's just a matter of getting them together, getting it set, settled and stable, yeah. and uh, moving in the right direction. On the goalkeeping situation at Arsenal, it's a tough one because you got to. It's always been a case where you choose one. One keepers the. The undoubted you number one. You can't have two number ones. Yeah, you can't it's have two worked. number ones. One keeper is always the undoubted number one. And then the second guy is probably a you know, good understudy yeah. to have. You know, a you, reliable you, you understudy. Do you think then that, that Arsenal should be like Man U dropping? Like, um, letting, letting one, one go? Letting here go and yeah. let Ramsdale go. So In this case, yeah, possible. it looks like they got to let Ramsdale go. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I th well, I... Personally, maybe let Raya go. But, oh, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but because they just made a sign yeah, signing. Yeah, Chelsea had this problem a few years ago. Yeah. Do you remember? They brought in Kepper, wasn't it? Or yeah, did they replace Kepper with Kepa Mendy? And Mendy, yeah. yes. and Mendy started off okay, but and then, then Kepi... started making more mistakes then... than Kepper, and then he came back. So, yeah. as always, let us know what you think on that. But we've got to wrap this one up by talking about this gentleman here, and on my jersey that I wore, especially today, Bobby Charlton, in my humble opinion, the greatest England footballer of all time. I know it's up for debate, yeah. but you're talking about a footballer. There's only two, actually, who've won the World Cup, the European Cup, the League and the FA Cup. And that's him and Nobby Styles. I know Ian Callahan. people say about Liverpool fans, but he didn't actually play in the World Cup final. He was part of the squad. Yeah. So there's only Charlton and Styles who have won everything. And if you add to the fact that Bobby Charlton was like no English midfielder or any world midfielder until Franz Beckenbauer came along. They'd never seen a player like it. The closest in modern football might be a cross, actually, between Paul Scholes and maybe Steven Gerrard and even a bit of Frank Lampard. So you've got all yeah, three there. Three, all three but he had all of it. Yeah. Plus, he struck a ball like no one I've ever seen, and, and a ball hard. that weighed like a lead weight. Yeah. I mean, I've seen the World Cup final more times, the 66 World Cup final, more times than I can remember. I've got it on DVD and I've seen it dozens of times. He was extraordinary. I've also seen most of the 1968 European Cup final when uh, they were the first English team, Manchester United, to yep. win in Europe. He dominated that game, scored twice. Did he score twice? Twice, wasn't it? Yeah. And when you consider that... What was that? That was 68. Ten years yeah. earlier, he was in a plane where some of his best friends died and it became his and Matt Busby's mission to win the European Cup, to honour those lost, the Busby's babes. Look, it's always contentious. There's no right or wrong answer to this, but for me, he was without doubt the most dignified, the most honourable and arguably the greatest complete footballer that England has ever produced. Yeah. Also, he got a... Take note about the shoes they were wearing. The boots were yeah. heavy. The pitch was muddy. Mm -hmm. Remember? How, how does it, as a, as a Man U fan, well, it was a how shock. Does mean, what does it mean to me? It was a shock when I got the news. But I mean, considering the age, it shouldn't be. But it still came as a shock, as a surprise. And uh, and then af thereafter, you know, you get all the tributes coming in. You know, of course... I probably am from a different generation of United fan where we didn't watch him play, but of course we still got ourselves educated with the exactly. generation before the legends that we had in our clubs where we found sources to watch 
bits and pieces of what they did and we read about it and so you know we got ourselves educated yeah. and just to be clear I didn't watch him either I'm not that old <laughs> <laughs> he retired the year I was born yeah. I mean he retired sort of mid 70s but yeah I've seen a lot of footage yeah. of Bobby Charlton so yeah. you can see what kind of player he was a great player and you know the esteem with which people hold him yeah yeah. you and know how your mind plays tricks for you I don't know if this If I was going to ask you this Hank Young I don't know if I've met Bobby Charlton or not because I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure I've been in the same room as him at an event in Singapore. But I, I, know, I, have, I know I haven't spoken to him. I've, I've met Nobby Styles. Nobby Styles is a legend. I sat in the dugout with Nobby Styles at the National Stadium. And we chatted for like half an hour about Best and Law. I've met Dennis Law. I spoke to Dennis Law. I met George Best's agent. One of my greatest regrets was I was talking to George Best's agent while George Best was in the room with him and I, and I just wanted him to pass the phone yeah. and it's one of my big regrets. But I never met uh, Bobby Charlton. But one thing I will say about Bobby Charlton that maybe Singaporeans won't appreciate, the cultural legacy of Bobby Charlton. To my father's generation, right, this man... Bobby Charlton has so much to answer for. When I was a kid, whenever my dad lined up a long-range shot, he'd always shout, Bobby Charlton! Oh, Every yeah. time. You don't need to do commentary, right? You don't yeah, need to do commentary. Yeah, yeah. If a ball fell to my dad 20 yards outside, Bobby Charlton! Bobby Charlton! <laughs> Every time. My PE teacher did it at school. Anytime he lined up a long-range shot, Bobby Charlton! Right? For this generation, Steven Gerrard! Yeah. So for my dad's generation, the long-range thunderbolt was completely synonymous with Bobby Charlton. For a moment or two, he made an entire generation think they could shoot like him. <laughs> of course they couldn't, couldn't, but for a second or two, they could dream. Yeah. Great for, for, for me, I think I'm not British, neither am I a Man U fan. Yeah. So my, my, my relationship with Charlton isn't that strong. Uh, that, that strong, obviously, but you know, you keep reading about it. First, my first impression when I first see him in action is like, why is this old man playing? Because it's yeah. Yeah, half ball, yeah, the comb yeah, over, yeah, the comb over, yeah, half yeah. balding hair. So I thought it's old, but he's actually just tw- in his late twenties by then. So and then I, I and then the the one thing that really attached me to him was the way he came back from that Munich air disaster. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. So many of his teammates, eight of his teammates died during that that, that things. Talented he, players. And then he was the one alone, and he was shouldering the burden of the club to revive the club, mm-hmm. along with Matt Busby, of course, and. And he does it with such a dignity, such a modest, humble, his whole humble, life. his whole life. And you know, you know, anybody who suffered a disaster, you know, obviously will have some mental scars. Yeah. But you know, you hardly see it Trauma, when he when yeah. he does it, when when he actually you know, uh, became such a great player. You know, yeah. so uh, full full credit as a Liverpool uh, fan, full could, respect. Couldn't agree more. And anyone watching this who hasn't seen him play, go on YouTube. Watch the Man U European Cup final or watch the World Cup final or just watch Bobby Charlton highlights. You'll see a footballer like none other in world football of his generation. And also, if you'd like, send us your comments and views and thoughts on Bobby Charlton, the legend. Send them to Yahoo Southeast Asia on YouTube, Yahoo SG, Yahoo underscore MY on Twitter, Yahoo SEA on TikTok. Brilliant. Rajvinder, thank you as always, my friend. Welcome, yep. my pleasure. Yep. He'll be with us for part two. Do join us in part two. We'll be getting stuck into Singapore football and a football tournament in Singapore that this man is organising like none other you've ever seen. One of a kind. So make sure you join us in part two. In the meantime, take care. Thanks for watching. Keep all your comments coming. And we dedicate this episode to... Bobby Charlton. Bobby Charlton. Bobby Charlton! So, Bobby, Bobby, this one is for you. Bobby Charlton! <laughs>